Today, most people know Remedy as the video game company headed up by that one guy who is obsessed with coffee and who keeps making Twin Peaks like TikToks. Rip famous in recent years for creating standout games like Control and Alan Wake 2, Remedy's history goes back many, many years, and they weren't always the juggernaut that people think of them as today. In this video, we'll go all the way back to the beginnings of Remedy, when it was just a few people with a dream hunched over their PCs in a small office, and chart their meteoric rise across three decades to find out how they became the behemoth that they are today and what makes them so special. This is the rise of Remedy. Founded on August 18th, 1995, Remedy's headquarters are now in Ispu, Finland, some 12 miles outside of the country's capital of Helsinki, but it wasn't always there. The company actually made their first ever game in a basement, because when you're just starting out, what more do you need? When people think of Remedy's origins, they usually think of Sam Lake and Max Payne, but Lake wasn't actually an original founding member, and the Finnish studio's first game wasn't the noir bullet time detective thriller. It was an MS-DOS game called Death Rally. Remedy was founded by a handful of individuals that split off from an entity called Future Crew, which was heavily involved in the demo scene and the creation of PC game demos, software for audience consumption, between 1987 and 1994. The concept of Death Rally was very Mad Max. Players started out with a cheap VW Beetle-style car, and they had to compete in races against other cars that were armed to the teeth with all kinds of weaponry. Your objective was to win race after race, collect the winnings and upgrade your equipment until you face the final boss, the adversary. And it was while the founding members were toiling away in a basement that Sam Lake came aboard. See, in the mid-90s, Lake was studying English literature at nearby Helsinki University when his friend Petri Yarvileto told him that he was working on this cool new game called Death Rally with a cool new game studio called Remedy. Except, they had hit a snag in the game's development. They needed a writer to come in and write all the text in the game, especially now that players were starting to expect more from their games, now that consoles like the PlayStation 1 were starting to land. Luckily, Blake was adept at English literature from his studies and agreed to join the crew as a writer on the game. Death Rally was eventually released on September 7th, 1996. It was published by Apogee Software, or what we now know as 3D Realms, the company that also published the classic shooters Duke Nukem and Wolfenstein 3D. Critics of the time responded favourably to the game, with GameSpot saying it was simply the best top-down racer to come along in years, maybe even ever. Meanwhile, a reviewer from Next Generation Gaming Magazine said, once again, Apogee reminds us shareware can be fun. Death Rally is a simple, playable, enjoyable combat racing game with a retro, top-down perspective and a whole lot of action. Overall, people seem to love the humour and innovative ways you could destroy your opponents. There's a lot of debate surrounding Remedy's status at this time, with some saying that the company was an indie startup, while others come back by positing that you cannot be an indie developer if you're published by the publisher of Duke Nukem and Wolfenstein. However, it must be remembered that while we might consider these gaming companies and their games prominent today, video games and gaming culture were far more niche and underground 20 years ago. So considering they made the game in a basement, we'd settle on the side of them having indie developer origins. They were all dead. The final gunshot was an exclamation mark to everything that had led to this point. I released my finger from the trigger, and then it was over. With their first successful game now behind them, Remedy decided it was time to move on to their next project, the hard-boiled, crime-inspired detective shooter Max Payne. And remember earlier when we mentioned Petri Yarvileto, the guy who snapped up Sam Lake to work on Death Rally? He would be the game's director and have Lake come back and be the writer on Max Payne. Without this combination, Max Payne and Remedy's future could have looked entirely different, as Lake's writing has come to define the Nordic studio's narrative voice. 
A proper 3D third-person shooter that had groundbreaking mechanics like bullet time that slowed everything down Matrix style, Max Payne also harnessed the power of the new Max FX engine that the studio had developed to allow for all kinds of original graphical effects not seen in video games before, like a 3D particle-based system for gun smoke and muzzle flashes. It was clear that Remedy was on the cutting edge of technology and ambitious enough to want to create new experiences for players, something that is one of their defining features even up to this day. It is with the release of Max Payne in 2001 that we really saw Remedy cement its voice in gaming with a dark and gritty story that sees law enforcement agent Payne tracking down members of the Russian Mafia and putting a stop to their production of the mysterious Valkyr drug. Payne links up with the now infamous vigilante Mona Sachs and the story takes some dark twists and turns, culminating in an emotionally disturbing ending that everyone still remembers today. Still in his early 20s, Blake's writing prowess skyrocketed in earnest with the release of Max Payne, as the game let him demonstrate his skill in the modern realm of 3D video games. Not to mention that Max Payne himself is modelled on Lake, with Lake even dressing up as Payne and recording the game's graphic novel style cutscenes. And so Lake and Remedy became synonymous in one fell swoop, their stories intertwined for decades to come. Hello, this is Sam Lake from Remedy. Max Payne 2 turns 15 years old today. Just wanted to say thank you to all of you who have played the game. Thank you for all the nice comments along the way. Personally, for me as a writer, it was a wonderful project. Uh, you know, the whole world and the characters were already established and I could just go. Uh, uh, we pushed it more into film noir territory. We did all kinds of crazy TV shows in there um, and, and used them in the game world as well, like with the fun house for Address Unknown and Winnie Cognitis baseball bat boy shoot. Um, also uh, did nice things with the music. Uh, we had Late Goodbye from Poets of the Fall and, and we had the janitor listening to it and singing to it, all kinds of different layers for storytelling in there. It was a fun project. So, happy birthday, Max Payne 2. In October of 2003, two short years after the first game was released, Max Payne 2 would land on store shelves, with one of the most iconic game covers in gaming. Depicting Max Payne and Mona Sachs in a loving embrace, its stylish film noir art style is still easily recognised today, is the very epitome of less is more. Blake also returned as the primary writer on the sequel, bringing to the project his passion for storytelling and hard-boiled detective thrillers. Blake even went to the Theatre Academy of Finland to study screenwriting to make Max Payne 2's plot even more compelling than the original game. When all was said and done, Blake's script had more than 600 pages in total, which was five times that of the original game. Some say that sequels are never as good as the original work they try to emulate or follow up on, but Max Payne 2 received a plethora of industry awards, including Outstanding Art Direction at the Golden Satellite Awards in 2004, and Editor's Choice Awards from gaming media giants like GamePro, IGN and GameSpy. Max Payne 2 was lauded for not just bringing back what made the first game so original, the bullet time, the internal monologue, the gritty drama, but by building on these mechanics and polishing them. For example, Max was now able to pick up and use secondary weapons like grenades and molotovs and, and even give enemies some good old pistol whipping love with a new melee attack. But that's not all. While Max Payne 2 would use the same engine as the first game, it saw some significant overhauls because Remedy has always loved to remain on the cutting edge of technology. Max Payne 2 didn't technically use DirectX 9. But it mimicked a lot of its features such as reflection, refraction, shaders and ghosting. So especially on PC, there are significant graphical upgrades in when you look at objects like mirrors. This is most noticeable in scenes where pain is having lucid dreams and the screen goes fuzzy and out of focus. The overall polygon count was also increased for Max Payne 2, which meant smoother edges, especially on character models. In addition, Characters had a much greater range of expressions. In the first game, Payne had only one expression available. You know the one. It's the one Lake always pulls with the eyebrow wiggle. But in Max Payne 2, he often smirks and moves his eyebrows to react to different scenarios. 
which was a huge leap forward for gaming at the time. Despite these technological advances, the return of beloved anti-hero Max Payne and critical praise from the game's media, Max Payne 2 sold poorly and as such disappointed Rockstar Games and their parent company Take Two, who had recently invested in Remedy and acquired the rights to the Max Payne franchise. Max Payne 2, The Fall of Max Payne, turned out to be a very prescient title indeed, and is an example of what was to come. We are working on something new, something big, which of course means that the next big game from Remedy won't be Alan Wake 2. Remedy's financial failure with Max Payne 2 was a blessing in disguise. It forced the small Finnish company to look for new avenues of approach to their next game. And because Take-Two and Rockstar now had the rights to Max Payne, they needed a fresh new concept. Unknown to them at the time, this dismal situation would set them on the road to becoming the creative powerhouse we know them as today. So, after Max Payne 2 was released in 2004, Blake and his co-writer pals went back to the drawing board, this time gaining inspiration from the eerie and moody landscape of the Pacific Northwest. They already knew how to write grizzled and disturbed characters, but they needed to develop their ideas further. They found their inspiration in cult classic shows like Twin Peaks, which captured the rainy and remote setting they were looking for, while novels from Stephen King provided the writer trapped in small town America plot points perfectly. Thus, Alan Wake was born. It was six years before Remedy's Alan Wake would actually see the light of day, however. In this time, the team visited the Pacific Northwest on a research trip. They visited Oregon's Crater Lake, which would become Cauldron Lake in the game, and took tens of thousands of photographs so that they could create Alan Wake's environment with the utmost accuracy once they got back to Finland. They also partnered with Microsoft, ensuring that Alan Wake would be an Xbox 360 exclusive. This was in the mid to late 2000s, was dominated by Microsoft's new Xbox 360 console. Sony had come to the market late with a very expensive PlayStation 3, so it was a no-brainer for Remedy, still a small studio of 30 to 45 employees, to partner with the behemoth that was Microsoft. Despite the backing of Microsoft, Alan Wake stayed in development so long that gamers everywhere started to wonder whether the game was vaporware, that it was just as intangible as the darkness from the game itself. But in 2010, after six long years, the game discs were on store shelves and people were finally grabbing their flashlights to play out the story of the troubled writer for the first time. Alan Wake wouldn't make it to PC until 2012, the same year as the standalone follow-up called Alan Wake American Nightmare, which was released on Xbox Live Arcade. In 2013, Sam Lake revealed to Kotaku that Alan Wake had sold a total of 3.2 million copies which simply wasn't enough to fund the development of Alan Wake 2 at the time. So, instead of pursuing a sequel, Microsoft encouraged Remedy to lean into its transmedia storytelling, which was exactly what they'd begun experimenting with in Alan Wake's narrative of a writer trapped inside one of his own creations. In 2011, Pre-production for Remedy's next project, Quantum Break, began. Team Green worked with the Finnish developers to expand the live-action scenes first seen in Alan Wake and make it much more of a core focus. They also drew inspiration from Alan Wake's Quantum Suicide TV show, and it was at this point Remedy's shared universe, what we have now come to know as alternate world events, began to be developed. Max Payne and Alan Wake now had company. By now, the development team of Quantum Break numbered around 100 individuals, double what the company had a few years before. While Lake directed the game, a separate TV production studio was responsible for crafting the live-action TV segment, Time Travel Game. A first-party Xbox One exclusive, Quantum Break landed on the console in 2016. Microsoft quickly announced that this fresh new IP was now their best-selling Microsoft Studios game series. It helped that Quantum Break had a star-studded cast of actors like Lance Reddick, Sean Ashmore, Aidan Gillen, Dominic Monaghan. The success of the game proved that Remedy could turn its hand to different themes and narratives and showed the gaming world that it wasn't afraid to tackle innovative new ideas. Quantum Break marked a noticeable shift in the company, not only in honing its storytelling voice and overall game development, but also in the structure of business. 
around this time, Remedy swapped CEOs and started ramping up to be able to tackle more than one project at a time. And crucially, they parted ways with Microsoft. In 2017, Remedy garnered funding and became a public company, getting listed on the NASDAQ. They immediately began work on Control, this time partnering with 505 Games for publishing and marketing support. According to a GamesIndustry.biz report, Remedy received 7.75 million euros in development funds to help them complete Project 7, or what we now know as Control. It would only take the company two years from funding to fully release Control to the masses, which is a far cry from the days of Alan Wake's production, which lasted almost a decade. The team had also expanded since those days, and so by 2019, the year Control released, Remedy was ready to put all of their previous work together to create what would become the hub piece for their entire Remedy verse. Control revolves around Jesse Faden and the Federal Bureau of Control, a secret US government agency tasked with containing and studying paranormal phenomena. Faden gains supernatural abilities by finding objects of power, mundane objects like a rotary phone or a floppy disk that are seemingly from other dimensions and have been at the centre of major paranormal events in our own world. It is in Control that we first meet Janitor Artie, who is someone who has become crucial to the wider Remedy shared universe many years later. There you are. You are here about the job. Janitor's assistant. You need to go to the interview. Go that way to the elevator. Thanks. Elevator that way. Got it. Very good. I'm Artie. Janitor, by the way. You work for me. You can say I sent you. If they don't hire you, they do. You are no element. There be work for the axe. Take them behind the sauna, you heart. And it's the game that plants the company's flag in the ground and says, this is what we've created and how it is all connected. Control is the collision point of all of the Finnish company's work from the previous two decades. It takes the Twin Peaks-like supernatural ideas of Alan Wake, the time travel and abilities from Quantum Break, and the shooting and technological advancements of Max Payne, and crashes them together to create the ultimate Remedy game. But we're not talking about just concepts here. It ties all of their previous games together in a literal, shared universe that spans different dimensions, similar to how Stephen King's Dark Tower series ties all of his novels together. This isn't surprising, because King is one of Lake's many inspirations, so much so that he has even been on the KingCast podcast talking about it. 2019's Control also shows how Remedy still wanted to remain at the technological forefront of gaming graphics, with Control being among the first games released to utilise real-time ray tracing that had been built into the hardware of new video cards at the time. Control was so popular that it received numerous awards, like the Critics' Choice Award at the Golden Joysticks, Best Art Direction at the Game Awards, Action Game of the Year at the Dice Awards, and many more. To date, Control has sold over 4 million copies. With Remedy coming full circle for Control, it only made sense for them to now embark on the path to creating a sequel to Alan Wake. Full production on this Pacific Northwest nightmare began in the summer of 2021, and again, it was only two years until audiences were playing Alan Wake 2 in October of 2023. This time, Lake and the team leaned into the survival horror aspects of Alan Wake for its sequel, making ammo scarce and the game far scarier than the original, which was for all intents and purposes an action adventure with spooky elements. This time we would be charting Wake's descent into true madness and his battle with his arch nemesis doppelganger. Alan Wake 2 also introduced Saga, a detective on the trail of Wake. Saga has Nordic ancestry and her knitted winter sweater gives Nordic noir vibes, which correlates with the Twin Peaks-like television themes of the series. Players play as Alan Wake and Saga Anderson in two separate single-player stories that intertwine and be played in any order. Wake is trapped in the nightmare world, while Saga gets to explore Bright Falls many years after the first game, meeting the kooky cast of characters again. Alan Wake 2 incorporates detective elements when playing as Saga, where we can enter her Mind Palace, which is a visual representation of Saga's thoughts on the case. In the Mind Place, players use a pinboard to connect clues and piece together the game's mysteries. Playing as Wake, we have access to his writer's room, 
where we can see the outline of the novel he's writing. Remedy also doubled down on introducing Finnish culture into their work. One example of this is Ilmo and Jacko, the brothers saga meets on her journey to track down Wake. We also get to meet Artie again, the janitor we first came across cleaning the floor of the oldest house in control. Alan Wake 2 feels like the most complete Remedy game, in the sense that it brings everything that comes before together, like Control, but this time makes prominent loud and proud references to the other works. Up until Control, players were left wondering whether Remedy was just including nudge nudge wink wink easter eggs in their games. But with Alan Wake 2, there is no doubt. The Remedy verse is alive and kicking, and all of the company's protagonists definitely belong together. Alan Wake 2 has become one of Remedy's best received games both critically and with players. The game was given numerous scores of 9 out of 10 and 10 out of 10 by major gaming outlets like GameSpot and IGN. Alan Wake 2 was so popular that it sold more units and over three times more digital units in its first month than Control did in its first four months. In February 2024, Remedy purchased the rights to Control from 505 Games for 17 million euros. We know that Control 2 is the next title on Remedy's list, and it's a fitting one considering that they are now fully embracing the shared world concept for their games. Remedy is also working on remakes of the first two Max Payne games using the Northlight engine found in Alan Wake 2. They've identified what they're good at and what their audience wants, and they're pursuing it. We can also expect to see Remedy's cross-world settings in future games, with their narratives taking on their signature Lynchian, otherworldly vibes that the team has now fully honed their narrative voice on. It's almost certain that, no matter what form their projects take, they will stay on the cutting edge of technology. From the Max FX engine of Max Payne to their latest Northlight engine, Remedy shows no signs of slowing down in its pursuit of bringing its games to life with the best graphical fidelity possible. If we compare Remedy's latest offerings with Sony's first party titles like The Last of Us, for example, there's barely a difference. It really feels like Remedy has hit its stride in the years since Control was released. It's become a company that at once feels like a huge AAA studio in quality, but also a small developer with the care and love that each game is made with. They've managed to keep themselves relatively small and independent, while also remaining relevant with their eccentric storytelling and technological pioneering. The rise of Remedy has been a long one, one that has taken decades to perfect. The company has always made quality games, but there's no denying that we are now in the peak zenith of their creativity, unhindered by reliance on other companies to justify the creative projects they want to carry out. They've embraced the quirky Nordic concepts from their games, and have leaned into the strange Stephen King and David Lynch narrative structure. And just as Kojima was let loose after Konami, it feels like we're seeing Sam Lake's writing let loose from the bonds of corporate boardrooms that give his ideas the side eye because the suits have never had a creative bone in their body. We're finally seeing Remedy for what it has always been intended to be.